Okay? Let's go ahead and, as I said, open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son, for sending Jesus to be our Savior, and as today we look at the passages of his triumphal entry into Jerusalem for the final week uh, of his passion, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to know you, to be able to learn about who this Jesus was, and to be able to know what that means for us in our lives. In your most holy name we pray. Amen. Alright, so we do have a couple passages we're going to be focusing on. Uh, one is Matthew uh, chapter 21, 1 to 11. The other is Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. The next one is Luke 19, verses 28 through uh, really 48, but we won't go the, quite that far. And then the last one is John chapter 12, 12 to 19. And so we'll be starting in Matthew, with Matthew chapter 21. And I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone. And so if there is a background noise that you have, um, you are welcome to mute yourself uh, to prevent some of that background noise, um, and also to possibly prevent my own echo. But I'm going to go ahead and try leaving it unmuted for now, just to allow people to participate a little more fluidly and naturally. Um, but if it does become too distracting, just let me know and I can mute everyone and then uh, basically do kind of question sessions where when I unmute you. Does that sound good to everyone? Sure. Why don't yeah. you mute while you're reading and then have a question session? Okay, that sounds good. Okay. good idea, All right, so I will do that again. Okay, so we're going to first read the Matthew passage, so Matthew 21, 1 to 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you will say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth. Nazareth of Galilee. The uh, next one is Mark 11 uh, verses 1 to 11, and that one reads, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And then Luke's account is again Luke 19, 
chapter 20, or chapter 19, verse 28, uh, going through verse uh, 45, well, 48, but we, as I said, we might not do the whole thing. And when he said to these things, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going on up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just... Sorry. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them, and as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they, sat, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will, have, they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Okay? And then that goes into the temple cleansing. And then uh, John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19 reads... The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing? Look, the world has gone after him. All right. So now going back to Matthew... I'm going to unmute everyone. I'm going to mute myself because the kids just came back in. So. Okay, that's fine. You're always welcome to mute yourself if there's background noise. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and look at all four accounts that are in the Gospels, uh, mainly because there are just very small differences in some of them. And so those differences can be kind of interesting. And also, just to give us a little bit more on this Palm Sunday of uh, how to read it, as you guys uh, note from uh, the worship service, uh, we didn't do a Palm Sunday worship service. We did a, a Passion Sunday worship service. So instead of focusing entirely on Palm Sunday, we focused on the entirety of the Passion um, uh, in worship today. Uh, but I still wanted to focus a little bit more on Palm Sunday by doing uh, the reading. So first impressions, does anyone notice anything or have anything that they, they saw that kind of stood out to them? They're all the same except John. They're all the same except John? Okay. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very uh, similar comment. Uh, the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the Synoptic Gospels, and John is kind of considered the, the loner, the non-Synoptic Gospel. And the reason I say that is because Matthew, Mark, and Luke 
all are so similar in so many respects, and John is so different in, in other things. In fact, John uh, kind of avoids talking about the same things that Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke talk about at times, uh, and instead talk about other things. And I think that's, I think that's one, of the reasons, one of the reasons why, because John is uh, very likely the last gospel written and possibly many, many years after the first three. And so I feel like John didn't really need to repeat some of this stuff, instead wanted to elaborate on other things uh, to focus on. Why John's the one who talks about, there are many other things written about Jesus, there are many other stories about Jesus, but if I wrote all of them, there wouldn't be enough books in the whole world to, to tell them all. Uh, and so John's definitely trying for specific uh, stories to, to cover different areas than what the synoptic writer, uh, gospel writers wrote about. Um, it's interesting, though, that this is one of the events. Um, there's not a lot, but this is one of the events that is covered in all four of the gospels. Yeah, any other comments? I thought it was kind of neat where, at least from my reading on history, one of those guys predicted accurately what was going to happen, where they tore down the whole temple and all those things. That was a uh, yeah. yeah. So it's the interesting thing about uh, some of the focus on these gospels. Um, I'm getting a little bit of echo though. Um, I don't know who it's coming through. Um, so maybe if you guys can figure out how to. If you're not, if you're on a computer, it's pretty easy to mute yourself. If you're on a phone, it's a little harder. But I'm going to go ahead and mute again just to avoid that while. while talking. Um, so it's interesting that idea of Jesus kind of knowing what's going to happen, and then Jesus moving events forward to meet the prophecy. Uh, Matthew and John both actually emphasize the prophecy as well. Um, they, you know, they quote it. Uh, Matthew is really interesting because he then also not only quotes the prophecy, but he kind of says, okay, this is what Jesus did to ensure this prophecy was going to happen. And so it's interesting because it's real symbolic of how God works in our lives generically. God knows everything that's going to happen, and yet God still arranges events so that they happen the way he wants them to happen. Our faith, the fact that we have faith, is another example of that. God gave us faith, yes, but he did it through earthly means. He, you know, for a lot of us, had you be born in a family that got you baptized as an infant. Or for others of us, he had you meet that friend or that relative that made you or taught you about Jesus, and then you were able to trust those words as you move forward in the faith. Those are all things that happened to you here on earth. God arranged events so that things would go forward, so that you would have faith. Similar here, in a very, very real sense, Jesus is arranging events so that his final entry into Jerusalem, at least until his second coming, <laughs> his final entry into Jerusalem would go the way he wants it to go to have the effect on the people that he desires. And it's an amazing gift to see that God is using our earthly lives to have us be arranged, or to have things arranged in that. Oh, sorry, did I just mute you? I meant to unmute you. Uh, and so, it's an amazing gift to see that Jesus, with his all-knowing knowledge, tells the disciples what to do so that his entrance into Jerusalem would go the way he wants it to go. Um, yeah, that's a yeah, great comment. Any other comments? I think it's a neat thing that we have a God who is strong enough to do that. And we can trust that it's going to turn out the way he wants it to turn out, no matter what we do. Yeah, 
Yeah, we have a God who's powerful enough and strong enough to be able to make that arrangement. Yeah. I mean, in a certain sense, I, I probably isn't too hard for a God who's outside of time and all-knowing and all-powerful, but it's cool to know that we have a God who is that powerful and all-knowing. <laughs> yeah. So any other comments before we kind of dive specifically into each individual text? No? Okay. Well, did someone have something? To say? No? Okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and mute again. And again, you can always unmute yourself if you need to say something or something's, you know, really, you're really motivated to, to break in. Um, looking at Matthew now, Matthew chapter 21, specifically verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, well, we have to think, okay, well, who's the they? And so we actually have to back up a little bit in Matthew, back up to Matthew chapter 20, verse 29. And so this is the story that happens right before in Matthew. And the reason this is important is because it, it gives a little more context to who the crowds were. And it says, And they went out of Jericho, and a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Note what they're saying there in verse 30 versus what the crowds are saying in uh, chapter 21, verse 9. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So they're saying Hosanna down there, but up here in chapter 21, uh, or sorry, 20, verse 29, they're saying, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The word Hosanna is the same meaning. Hosanna means save us. Here he's saying, Lord, have mercy on us. He's asking for salvation. The difference, though, is in verse 31, the crowds then rebuked these two blind men, and they just started crying out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Which is interesting because in Luke's account, what happens when the Pharisees say, why don't you rebuke your disciples? Well, what happens is Jesus says the rocks themselves would cry out. Similar to here in Matthew where the, these two blind men are rebuked and they cry out all the louder. And so Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and, immedi and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. And then the very next chapter, the very next verse, you got to remember in the original Greek, they don't have chapters and verses. It just flows all together. So it says here, and immediately recovered their sight and followed him. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage. Okay? The two blind men have joined the crowd. They've come along with us. And now you've got the two blind men, Jesus, and this whole crowd of disciples following Jesus in near, you know, as they drew draw near to Jerusalem. Um, I guess I'll unmute you real fast just to see if anyone has any questions. Any questions so far? No? Okay. So we will keep moving there. All right. So Jesus sent the two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. And then it even says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Right? Jesus is rigging the deck. He is making sure things are going to go exactly how he wants them to go, which is similar to what he's been telling the people all up until now. He's been saying, Don't tell anyone about me. 
keep it quiet, you know. And now we're in the final week, the final moment where Jesus is going into Jerusalem, and what does he tell them? Shout out. Let's make sure things happen the way it's supposed to happen. Almost in a certain sense that he's intentionally in sense, you know, uh, causing this riot to force the hand of the, the Jewish leaders, although that's speaking beyond what Scripture specifically says. But uh, it's all, you, know, you get that, a little bit of that sense. Um, interesting note here, too, where Jesus says to get the, the donkey. Uh, notice it says a donkey, uh, sorry, a colt, and the colt's mother, okay? So you get the, the donkey, which is the mother, and then the colt. Compare that to Mark, where it only talks about the colt, and compare it to Luke, where it only talks about a colt, and compare it to John, where it's just a young donkey, right? So I'm going to unmute. But Why? that's not because they were reporting different events. It's just because different people remembered and found important to say certain details. It's all okay. the same event. So that, that's a good, that's a good <laughs> potential. Yeah. Any yeah. other comments or questions on that? I kind of agree with that. If you had a group of people that witnessed a car accident, you'd probably get a whole bunch of different stories that are similar, but not exactly the same. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, so as we're talking about these differences, I'm going to say there's a large echo back. Okay, so again, it's not that they're reporting different events. It's the same event, but different details are pulled out. Okay, and so in Matthew, he pulls out that there is a cult and the cult's mother. And in, Ma in Mark, Luke, and John, they don't find that as important to pull out. They just pull out the, the young donkey. Okay, and so... Notice, though, in Matthew, he quotes a little more than what John quotes. John quotes uh, in verse uh, 12, 15, he says, uh, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. But Matthew quotes a little bit more, and he says, Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Okay? So Matthew here is trying to emphasize something a little differently than the other ones. I think ultimately you get kind of to the same place depending on uh, which route you take uh, in terms of the emphasis. But that emphasis is really going for the idea that this is a young donkey. It's a donkey versus something else, like a horse or an elephant, which in Roman times, if you're the conquering king, you could e just as easily come in on a horse or an elephant to, to show your power and your prestige. In fact, the donkey idea was a little more specific to Israel's history, okay? But not just the donkey, the other aspect of this is this is a young donkey that no one has ever rid on. This is a very humble donkey. It's not a, a full-grown, strong donkey. Okay. The other part of this, too, then, is okay. Uh, Mark, Luke, and John speak of it as just the, 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 uh, the young donkey. Matthew, though, contrasts that young donkey with the old one, kind of in a certain way, forcing you to recognize that he was mounted on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Okay, He's making you, kind of forcing the reader to see, hey, it's not just any donkey, it's a young donkey. Okay, Which further emphasizes the idea 
that um, uh, further emphasize the idea that Jesus is entering Jerusalem as a king, but a different sort of king. Okay? I'm going to unmute. That's very much in line with the original Zechariah prophecy, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then he says, Zechariah does, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and so on. He's making a contrast, and those people knew those passages, yeah. that this was a king, but it was a different king who did not come on a war horse and a chariot. Yeah. Good. So why the difference? What is the focus on this king? He's not a king that's going to oust the Romans, and of course that disappointed some of them and irritated others. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. So we get the difference in the king. This king is coming in peace. Not in conquering procession, but in the war is done, I am here in peace. Okay? That somewhat kind of confuses us because often we think, oh, Jesus hasn't conquered yet. He is supposed to conquer on the cross. But the reality of the Gospels and the way the Gospels portray Jesus' time here on earth is from the time of his birth all the way unto the cross and then even until his second coming, the kingdom of heaven is already here. That's why John the Baptist is proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? It's here, it's coming, it's not necessarily reached its final fulfillment, but Jesus is already here in fulfillment of all of prophecy in fulfillment and restoration of all of creation. Okay? Which is a very important aspect of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, yes, is the Sunday as he, you know, moves on the procession to the cross, but it's also a reflection on the fact that the fact that Jesus is here at all, the fact that he was born and lived all of that testifies to the fact that God dwells on earth. The kingdom of heaven is here. Creation is restored. And as we move forward, we see that that final restoration, though, is yet to come. Which, as we move forward in this, we see that same kind of story play out. Going back to Matthew uh, chapter 21, going down to verse 6, it says, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks in the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Okay, again, the crowd is recognizing Jesus as, God, as, the, up, as the king entering into the city. Okay, spreading the cloaks, preparing the road, cutting the palm branches, those are all relative or those are all things indicative of a king entering your city. Okay? And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Okay, that's verse 9 right there. And those crowds of people were probably shouting, Save us, thinking he was going to save at least some of them thought he was going to save them from the Romans, and yet they were prophetically saying that he actually is the Savior. Yeah, yeah. And so the meaning here, Hosanna to the Son of David, okay? Son of David is a messianic title, okay? It's meaning they were recognizing him as the Messiah, as the Christ, but it also has undertones as divine, and furthermore, 
it also has undertones of this idea of a conquering, you know, hero in the sense of the son of David's coming to restore the kingdom of Israel. But as John pointed out, it was kind of that and all the above. Okay? Hosanna to the son of David. They're shouting for, you know, praise and rejoicing to God. And yet they're also saying, okay, God's now going to deliver us from the Romans. And God's also going to deliver us from our calling. The word Hosanna itself, save us, had by this point in uh, history actually taken on kind of a liturgical sense. It wasn't necessarily used for kings. It was, though, used when talking to God, especially in the Psalms and other things. Um, this, in fact, if you go to Psalm 118, verse 26, you don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and do it for you. Uh, it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Okay? And then it's interesting because the psalm continues, Bind the festival sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. Well, it's wonderful that they're quoting this because in the psalm, Jesus is approaching the sacrificial altar, but we're not going to go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, so going back to Matthew 21, uh, verse 9, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, okay? Or Hosanna in the heavens or to the heavens is another way of, of kind of saying that, okay? Um, yeah, so it's what they're saying is speaking just monuments of praise and also has just so many different powerful meanings. And you can apply all these meanings to this context of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Yeah. Any other comments or, or thoughts or questions on that? Yeah, uh, in, in these uh, passages, uh, there's a reference to the people are there all excited because they know of Jesus' miracles, particularly they mention uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. That's part of their uh, enthusiasm. Yeah. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, that's in, uh, in John. They're specifically focused on that. In Matthew, he just healed two blind men who joined the crowd. Um, I don't remember Mark and Luke. What, uh, what was the uh, focus before that? Um, yeah, the blind Bartimaeus in Mark, and then uh, let's see what was Luke. Luke was uh, oh, he just given uh, some parables about the kingdom of heaven and uh, the ten minas. Uh, so. Uh, Zacchaeus uh, had also just been called recently. Um, so it's possible Zacchaeus is also in this crowd, uh, <laughs> which is kind of neat, <laughs> since Zacchaeus has issues with crowds, right? <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm, that's, that is a sidetrack. Yeah, so if, if the people had the idea that here was somebody coming that was going to finally throw off the Roman shackles, why do you suppose the Pharisees were irritated and told him to get these people to shut up? I don't think the Pharisees and the Sadducees minded the Romans as much as the people did. Because the That's Romans right. gave the That's Pharisees and the Sadducees a, a kind of a legitimacy to their leadership within religious matters and even within uh, the city for, to a certain extent. So I don't Especially think the... the uh, I don't think they really wanted the Romans under there at all because they were gloating under the Roman rule because they had authority. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the Romans were kind of using them and they were kind of using the Romans as well. Yeah. It was a I scratch your back, you scratch mine type of deal. Uh, although the power still laid with Rome, uh, as we find out uh, around AD 60 when the Romans do finally just destroy all of Jerusalem, um, but, uh, as of now, though, the, the Jews are still very happy to kind of play nice, the Jewish leaders, that is. Yeah. Okay, so then continuing on in Matthew 21, uh, verse 10. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. 
And so we have kind of this this roller coaster ride as we're going forward. You know, you kind of get the build up as they're kind of going up, preparing, getting the the colts and everything, and then the, the wonderful room excitement as they're going down and singing Hosanna, and then you hit the bottom, and you hear the crowd say, "This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee." They missed the point. They prophetically said, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, with all the amazing meanings of that passage. And then they say, he's just a prophet. Oh, not just a prophet. He's a prophet from a, no, from a, from a nowhere place called Nazareth of Galilee. And it's just like, oh, you guys were so close, and then you missed it. Oh, oh. So that's how Matthew goes, and then Matthew goes into the temple cleansing after that. Um, any questions then on Matthew before we go into Mark as the next focus? No? Okay, so going into Mark now, Mark chapter 11. Uh, now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, and which no one has ever sat, untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. Okay? And so now here, Mark emphasis, instead of kind of on the cult, you know, now he's giving a little more details about, you know, the situation that the disciples witnessed and experienced, okay? And so you see them saying, okay, they're supposed to go in, we're supposed to untie it and bring it, and here's what we say. And then it says, and they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. Okay, well, there's a little more there, right? It's, it's tied to a door, it's outside in the street, it's kind of almost in a certain sense like it's kind of just sitting there by itself, and you're kind of thinking, well, what's going on here? And then, of course, you get the questioners in verse, uh, Mark 11, chapter, or verse 5, where it says, and some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And so it, it's, they're replaying, you know, the, Mark is replaying for us the exact scenario that Jesus already told the disciples it was going to happen. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and sat on it. Okay? Or, sorry, sorry, I skipped. And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. Okay? So, interesting that Mark would give more detail in certain aspects than Matthew, because Mark is known for giving less detail than Matthew uh, typically. So when Mark gives more detail, you have to say, well, why, Mark, are you doing this? Okay? Thoughts. Why would Mark spend additional time on the detail of Jesus' prophecy in the detail, in, in kind of the directing of the events? No thoughts? He probably wanted to make sure that people people understood it or, or this was significant. Um, yeah. Because this is this is the first time that Jesus has really come out and said, Yes, I'm the Messiah, I'm the I'm the Son of God and, and he's basically telling the, the Jewish leadership that okay I am now committing what you consider to be blasphemy. Yeah, that's a good that's a good thought. In other words, kind of focusing on the idea that Jesus is doing this to fo to to emphasize the fact that he is very much the Messiah, that he very much is the Son of God, and he can do these things uh, for this very real purpose. Yeah. Another interesting thing here is you get, John, you get Mark's favorite word here, this word immediately. 
uh, in verse 2, and then again in verse 3. Um, uh, that's all for this story, but uh, immediately is one of Mark's favorite words in his gospel. And so, uh, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a cult. Okay? So, in other words, this is stuff that you're gonna, the disciples are going to enter, and boom, it's going to be there. Okay? And then, you know, someone's going to confront you, and you're going to just say, the Lord has need of it, and he will send it back here immediately. So, it's like, Here's what's going to happen. Boom, you're going to go into a village. Someone's going to confront you. You're going to say this. Boom, he's going to release it to you, and you can then bring it to me. And it, it very kind of puts the urgency on there. And then also focuses on how well this, this goes forward. And so you get the sense that Mark is very much emphasizing this son of God aspect that using that divine knowledge and then just how perfectly that divine knowledge plays out in the details as well. Okay? And then going on uh, in, in Mark chapter 11, verse uh, 7 is where we continue. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Note the, the similarities and the differences in these passages. And so, in Matthew, he says, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In Mark, he says, Hosanna... Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Okay? Both start with Hosanna. Both end with Hosanna in the highest. Okay? Mark, though, says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Versus Matthew, who says, Hosanna to the son of David. Right? Okay? And then the next one says, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David in Mark. And then in Matthew, he says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay? And so, similar things, just focusing a little differently in the order and how they're saying it. Okay? Mark's is a little longer again. A little more elaborate, talking about, you know, kind of a little more detail in what's going on. Almost like Mark is explaining a little bit what some of this stuff means by quoting more out of uh, Psalm 118. Because once again, they're getting this from Psalm 118. Okay? But here again, the people are prophetically saying what they don't understand. They think that the, the uh, restoration of the kingdom of their father David has something to do with the Romans. Yeah. When in fact they are prophesying that it's not that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> Notice the one thing that is also the same. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay. Yeah. Underline that. I know some of you can't see this, but I'm going to underline that on my screen just to emphasize that a bit. Okay. All right, so again, crowds giving the prophetic uh, response to Jesus entering to the city, and then kind of just this letdown. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out again with the twelve. <laughs> it's just like, what? <laughs> you just had this amazing, triumphant procession, and then... Oh, and then it's just kind of, okay, he looked around and then left. <laughs> what did he see like, when he looked down, though? What did you say? Planning, he was, I think, planning for what was going to happen tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Um, it also kind of uh, puts the, the idea of the temple cleansing in a little different order here. And so Mark leaves the temple cleansing for the next day, whereas uh, Matthew and uh, Luke, and I think it was John also, no, yeah, Matthew and Luke, uh, he goes straight into the temple 
and cleanses the temple right after the procession. Um, so that's once again, they don't have to put things in the exact same order because they're each gospel writer is putting it in the way that fits the, the focus and the emphasis that he's doing in his message. Uh, in biblical times, the point was not to do things exactly in chronological historical order like we seem to focus on nowadays. For them, it was you put it in order of importance and in order of how you wanted to emphasize the message. Okay? All right. Any questions then on Mark before we get into Luke? Okay. So now Luke starts off in chapter 19, verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that was called Olivet, he sent two of, two of the disciples. Okay. First, before we go into the disciples again, Luke has a little more focus on geography than the other gospel writers. Um, it's not universal in every single description, but it's very interesting, though, that the Gospel of Luke begins in the temple and ends in the temple. Okay? It begins in the temple. Uh, I'll just pull it up real fast. With the birth of John the Baptist, right? So who, how is John the Baptist told that he, or how, how are John the Baptist's parents told? Well, the priest Zechariah was in the temple doing his duties. And then at the very end of Luke, uh, I'll get there. It says, you know, so after the ascension, uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 53 says, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. Okay, so geography does play a certain symbolic sense in Luke. Okay, and so now you get this idea of, okay, he's given a little more detail of geography, you know, the mount that is called Olivet. Okay, um, he's coming through these things, and these things will then have significant later on. So he's giving the context of that geography. Okay? Um, and notice he also says, drew near to, to, Beth, uh, to Bethphage and Bethany. Okay? The drawing near occurs again in verse 37 and again in verse 41. Okay? The point is, is once again, he's focusing on each of these geographic areas is kind of a, a kind of, a, in a certain sense, a symbolic separation of the story for Luke. You know, he's saying, okay, he's drawing near, and this is what happens. He's drawing near, and this is what happens. He's drawing near, and this is what happens. Okay, and so it's a certain sense of tying the geography, the history, the reality of the world around us to the reality that's happening in Christ. And Luke especially likes tying the reality of the world around us into the gospel story, which is why he includes so many historical details, so much geography, so much other stuff. Uh, and so it's really neat to hear how he does that because he's focused on Jesus is not some, you know, God who's far off and far away. No, Jesus is God who's near and dear and close to even the lowest of us in these odd places in this real life earth. Okay? So moving forward then with uh, Luke 19, verse 30. Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat, Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as they were told them. Okay, and as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks in the colt. They set Jesus on it. Okay, again, we get a little more detail when you combine this with Matthew and Mark. Um, it was the owners who confronted them. Okay, 
and you get this idea of, again, the prophetic fulfillment of Jesus' words. Um, any other, I mean, that's kind of the, the main ones for, for Luke on, on that. Uh, any other comments or questions? I know we've kind of gone over the same thing three times now, but, but uh, any other comments or questions that popped up as we read through that section? Luke's attention to detail might have something to do with his audience, too. Yeah. Specifically, Luke uh, expecting people who are not familiar with uh, the Jewish customs and life uh, to be reading. Yeah. And specifically, Theophilus, who was either his intended you know, first audience or his editor or, or something along those lines, but Theophilus being a Greek name for, you know, uh, uh, one who, uh, who, uh, who brings glory to God. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks in the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks in the road, and as he was drawing near, already on the way down, see again, verse 37, as he was drawing near, okay, so another new kind of focus section in Luke's, in Luke's retelling of this. Already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Luke focuses a lot on the works and how those works impact the creation around him. Okay? And so they're specifically called out here they're giving praise to God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. And they say, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Okay. So let's compare what they're saying here with, uh, in verse 38, with what they said in Mark and Matthew. Again, they're saying the same thing. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That's consistent across all three, okay? So there's definitely a focus there. But then what else does Luke add in here? Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Does that remind anyone of anything? Oh, the angel said once earlier. Yeah, the angel said once earlier. Yeah. Whose gospel reported the, the angelic message? Luke. Yeah, the Gospel of Luke, right? The angels announcing peace in heaven and glory to God and or, and, and uh, uh, I can't say it right now. Glory to God in the highest and on earth on, on men who whom he's, he's, he's well pleased, right? That's only recorded in Luke. The message to the shepherds is only recorded in Luke and so now Luke is tying this coming king, as he walks into Jerusalem, he's tying it with the same message that the angels proclaimed to the shepherds, right? Uh, and then he also says, glory in the highest, which the other ones also include, you know, in the highest at the end of theirs. Um, you got to remember, it wasn't that the crowds were just chanting the exact same thing. The crowds were probably chanting all of this stuff and Matthew, Mark, and Luke are just pulling out specific parts of that chant to focus on that fits kind of the main thrust of their gospel story and message in their particular book. Uh, and it doesn't mean that any of them aren't true. It means that they're all true and that each gospel writer, just like each different preacher, has a different focus and a different message that he's trying to present when he is telling the gospel story. Um, I'm sure that I don't preach the same way as Pastor Chittick. I'm sure I don't play, preach the same way as Pastor Thur or, or Pastor Thompson or Pastor Dahl. I'm sure we each have our different way of saying the same gospel message. Okay? But it is unique, though, that all three have said, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Right? Again, tying the prophecy of of coming into Jerusalem on a donkey as very much this is a king entering his city, right? Any comments or questions on that before I finish off in Luke? 
I have, <coughs> excuse me, I have a note here on verse 40, and, and I don't know where it came from, it's just an archaeology, when he's talking about the stones growing out. Okay, so let's move on then, we'll get to that verse. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And so what was your note again? I just, it just says archaeology. I don't know when I put it in there. but Okay. So in other words, what it could be, you know, maybe that note is referencing what type of stones. You know, is it the stones of the city? Is it the stones on the street? Is it the stones in the field sitting next to the street? Um, that could be, maybe that's what your note's going for. I'm not sure. Or maybe it's that archaeology which also points back to, to Jesus. Archaeology. Maybe not archaeology, that's, isn't that people? Okay, yeah. I can but, definitely see but that. Science in general. Yeah. So I like to take it as the idea of uh, stones as kind of just being part of creation, kind of this inanimate object, and how when God desires his glory to be praised, even inanimate objects would fulfill his will in this, uh, tying it back to the announcement from the angels to the, to the, to the uh, shepherds. It's the same idea that heaven just cannot restrain itself and just burst out with this amazing message that the kingdom of heaven is on earth. And so here again, the kingdom of heaven is rejoicing, and if his disciples wouldn't do it, then the stones of the street, the stones in the field, the the stones of the archi of the of the uh, architecture and archaeology around them would cry out in their place, right? Because God desires this to be a glorious time, and so therefore that's going to happen one way or another. Yeah. Any other comments on this? So, interesting little side note, and I have not had time to go and check this, um, and so maybe you guys can do this during the week. Um, one thing I read was that verse 39 here is the last time in the Gospel of Luke that the Pharisees talk. And it's to tell them, to tell Jesus, rebuke your disciples. Um, whether that's significant or not, I don't want to put too much on it, but it, it would be kind of interesting if that is the, the, the final one because it's just all the way to the end then they're trying to hush up this Jesus and his disciples, right? So as I said, I, I, I didn't have time to track it down to, to really look at that, but I, I did read that at, uh, somewhere that... That, that, that they said that that's the final thing the Pharisees had to say. And then uh, Luke goes into... Final. Go ahead. Uh, on that, uh, the, if, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And my, my Bible had a reference to Habakkuk 2.11, uh, which says, the stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it which I think are talking about the temple. Okay. I, I couldn't quite make it all that. You said the sons... Say it one more time. The stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Okay. Which I think might be talking about the temple. Yeah. So that's going... Habakkuk 2.11, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so in Habakkuk it says, Habakkuk, Habakkuk I can never say that right. Um, uh, verse uh, 10 says, You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many people as you have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork responds, Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. 
Um, Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire, and nations weary themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Yeah. And so that's a, I, yeah, I hadn't caught that before. Yeah, so that does, when you tie this back to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, I can't say it today. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing because it, it gives an, a, a, a kind of a fun parallel there with the idea of the earth crying out, right? You know, the temple and the earth crying out. Yeah, that's neat. Okay, moving on to 1941 then. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it and saying, Would that you even had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. So here Jesus is saying, you know, if they just realized that I was coming in peace, then all of this would not have been an issue. But, you know, it, it is, and it did happen, you know, Jesus foretelling the destruction of Jerusalem here. Okay? And then from there, as you said, we go from that into the temple. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Okay? And so that's kind of the uh, conclusion then of Luke's account of his triumphal entry. Uh, thoughts and comments on Luke's triumphal entry. Or the, the not Luke's triumphal entry. The triumphal entry as recorded by Luke. <laughs> okay. And so we'll go through John's now. Okay, so in John's, this very much follows on the heels of the raising of Lazarus. Okay. And now in John chapter twelve, verse twelve it says the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Okay? So I'm going to highlight that. Hosanna. But then the common theme, again, is blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay? So that's once again consistent across all four of the Gospels. Note, though, the focus here is a little bit on the fact that the people left the city and went out to meet him. Okay? That is, once again, proper respect for a king coming to your city. You don't wait for the king to come to you. You go out and meet the king and bring him in with you. That's the same message that we get for Christ's second coming that Paul talks about in uh, the first Thessalonians, second Thessalonians, I can't remember right now, where we, even the dead, will rise from the dead and be swept up into the sky and come down with Jesus on that final day. Okay? Same message here in John, where we go out, the crowds go out to meet him and bring him in and usher him in with us, okay? Which is a wonderful illustration, not only of what was a common practice for kings back then, especially if, it was a, you, know, if you wanted to show proper respect, but it's a wonderful example of how excited and how wonderful it is to have Jesus Come to us. And then after the fact, then it says, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, and then he focuses on the prophecy, right? And then verse 16, moving on, uh, chapter 12, verse 16, it says, his, di his disciples did not understand these things at first, 
But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Okay? And so, John's gospel is also a very good example of the people believe, the people have these amazing responses, but they just don't fully get it until after Jesus was glorified, until after his death and resurrection. Okay? And so, focusing here, John just doesn't even wait to, to get you to realize that. He just flat out tells you, yeah, we were doing all these things, and we didn't have any clue what we were doing and how important they were until after the fact we thought back and were like, whoa, that was even bigger than we thought it was. <laughs> Which is the same thing that happened with all these crowds, right? Uh, but John is very explicit in, in, in pointing that out. Thoughts or comments so far before we finish, John? You know, that whole idea of uh, thinking about things after the fact, that might just be human nature. Um, like being starstruck in the presence of the Beatles or something, you might say something you didn't really intend to say until later you think, well, that was kind of a dumb thing to do. Or the other way around. I wish I would have said that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I think that is a lot of human nature. Sometimes we just need time to process things, or we need that final puzzle piece to fall into place before it becomes clear what the puzzle is, right? And I think John's Gospel is very, very big on that. He, he, you don't get that final understanding until that final puzzle piece falls into place. And then it's just an epiphany moment in John's Gospel after the resurrection. The disciples finally get it. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, chapter tw so John chapter 12, beginning with verse 17. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard what he had done, that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that they are gaining nothing? That, sorry, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Okay? And so verse 17 and 18, you get this word, this idea of the people showed up because of the sign. They believed but they didn't understand until the very end, okay? But the signs in John's Gospels are all kind of... Uh, John makes special emphasis on each of the signs, okay? Uh, specifically, so if you go up to, to Lazarus, Lazarus... Uh, let's see if I can find if they've got that word here, or if they only throw it down at the end. Oh, no, yeah, so all the way up in verse chapter 11, verse 47, so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. Okay? But then the actual raising of Lazarus isn't called a sign until after the fact in, the, uh, in verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 18. Okay? But the, the idea of signs in John's Gospel uh, are, are, is kind of a big deal. In fact, the very first miracle, uh, Jesus' changing of the water into wine, is called the first of Jesus' signs. Okay? And that kind of sets the tone then for some of the things to look at as you're reading through John's Gospel. That idea of, okay, this was a sign. He does other miracles that John doesn't call a sign. But the signs have kind of a special focus and emphasis of they bring people into belief and following of Jesus, but yet not necessarily understanding. As I said, the understanding in John's Gospel is held off all the way until the, the end in the, in the resurrection, okay? And specifically, even the, uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, so Pentecost. And then the Pharisees, they, of course, are grumbling. You see that you are gaining nothing? Look, the world has gone after him, okay? They're, they're just getting frustrated. 
So maybe there's a lesson for us here, too, that we don't have to necessarily understand in order to believe. When Doubting Thomas finally saw him and said, My Lord, or whatever you all said there, Jesus said to him, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So the important part's the believing, not the understanding. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So the understanding is helpful, but you're right. The important part is the belief. Yeah. Uh, same thing with our faith, right? Um, we have faith even though we don't fully understand all the mysteries of God. The important thing is belief and faith. Yes, understanding is also important. It can be very beneficial to someone's faith, or it can be, lack of understanding, it can also be very harmful to someone's faith, but the important part is the faith, not the understanding, okay? Well, that's kind of handy, since some of those things we're not capable of understanding at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very true. Yeah. So any other final comments or questions as uh, we kind of wrap things up and close? No? Okay. Well... I'm glad that we were able to have uh, a lot of people join uh, today. Uh, we are not going to have Bible study next week because it will be Easter Sunday, and I want each kind of household, as we're kind of in our own little household, but I want each household to take time and you know, do, do some special uh, devotions or their own personal thing that day, and also just take a chance to celebrate Easter next Sunday as well. Okay. Um, Coming up this week, we've got on Thursday, we're going to have our Monday Thursday worship online. On Friday, we'll have our Good Friday worship online. And then, of course, Easter will be uh, on Sunday, and it'll also be online. Uh, it's The coronavirus is still causing too much uh, trouble with trying to get together right now, so we will do what we can with technology and uh, just enjoy each other's uh, presence virtually, unfortunately not uh, in reality, but just virtually. Uh, so please uh, take time to continue to call and, and be uh, a good neighbor to your fellow friends and family and neighbors, and uh, we will join again in Bible study then the Sunday after Easter, um, possibly in person. I'm not super hopeful of that, but uh, possibly, I suppose, there's a small, small possibility there. Um, no final comments or questions? I will go ahead and close in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for again sending your Son, for allowing him to set the tone, for allowing him to enter into Jerusalem according to his will, according to your will, to show that he is the King, come to save us. Hosanna, dear God, save us as we go through this life and especially help us to understand and to see our salvation in Christ, in the cross, in His death, in His resurrection, and most of all, in His continued life in our hearts and as we await His second coming. In your most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Again, thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to close out the recording.